Grant ultimately becomes stalled in Virginia, trying to lay siege to Petersburg. Meanwhile, however, there is one general, the one that hit, um, Philip Sheridan and William Tecumseh Sherman are Grant's favorite generals who are subordinate to him. And when Grant leaves the West to take over the army in Virginia and to fight against Robert E. Lee, he leaves the Western arms and Western army in the very capable hands of William Tecumseh Sherman. Now, William Tecumseh Sherman is fighting in the hills of Tennessee. Ultimately, he is tasked with trying to capture Georgia. Georgia, like South Carolina, were, was one of, the, one of the states that was absolutely most set upon seceding from the Union in order to protect so-called states' rights and slavery. And um, Sherman is put in charge of taking the war into Georgia. But Sherman has a very different approach. Now, Sherman is fighting against um, Joe Johnston, who was nearly as good a general as Robert E. Lee and, you know, the South's best hope for holding on to um you know, Georgia in the Deep South. Joe Johnston is going to fight against Sherman. But neither Sherman nor Joe Johnston, unlike their counterparts in Virginia, Lee and Grant, neither of them want one of these big battles, which is going to cost 30,000 casualties, like the Battle of the Wilderness or, you know, Spotsylvania. So what ends up happening is they fight these little skirmishes. Sherman starts marching towards Atlanta. Sherman starts marching towards Atlanta. And all along the way, Joe Johnston is trying to stop him. See, Joe Johnston is marching just a little bit north of Sherman as Sherman marches towards Atlanta. Now, Joe Johnston does slow his progress, but what, what, but what Sherman is able to do is to keep on kind of turning towards the left. And by turning towards the left, he's able to outmaneuver Joe Johnston without actually costing a lot of lives and reach the outskirts of Atlanta. But Joe Johnston's army is very much still a force that Sherman has to reckon with, right? And then Jefferson Davis does something which most historians think was probably ill-advised. He removes Joe Johnston from command because... What Joe Johnston was doing was he was trying to keep his army together. He would fight these little skirmishes against Sherman, and then he would retreat with his army and attack them again from a different direction, and Sherman would have to deal with them. Did Sherman usually run him off? Yes, but with great time, with great effort, with great money, and with some loss of life. Not as much as you would see in Virginia, but there was some loss of life in these battles. But what ends up happening is that Jefferson Davis, in charge of the Jefferson Davis, who was in charge of the Confederacy, tries to prevent um, Joe Johnston from retreating. Right, even though Joe Johnston's doing a pretty admirable job of keeping his army together, so what happens is Joe Johnston is able to, you know, keep this army together. But Jefferson Davis, since he thinks he keeps retreating, recalls him and puts General George John Bell Hood in charge instead. And what happens is John Bell Hood, now put in charge of the campaign to try and stop Sherman, wages these massive battles, which Southerners have been calling for against Sherman. And surely, slowly but surely, it becomes apparent that that was a bad idea. There's three major battles fought on the outskirts of Atlanta before Sherman can move in and capture Atlanta. And each one of these is a northern route. Each one of these, the Union badly defeats the Confederacy. The Confederacy lost 11,000 men and Sherman only lost around 5,000. So what ends up what ends up happening is they are able to finally defeat the um, Hood. I mean, things aren't going particularly well in Virginia because Robert E. Lee is fighting tooth and nail to prevent Grant's advance. And the only advances Grant is making is at the tremendous cost of human life. Um, Sherman's doing a better job of not losing so many men. And he gets within shooting range of Atlanta but he's not able to capture it. And this is summer of 1864. Both Grant and Sherman have made significant advances into the heartland of the Confederacy, 
but Grant has not captured Richmond, and Sherman has not captured Atlanta. And as a result, Confederate morale is surprisingly high. Right? The Confederates think that all they have to do is hold on to Atlanta and Richmond, and still the North will go home. And without a decisive victory for the Union Army, they are convinced that Lincoln cannot win his reelection in 1864. So Confederate morale is surprisingly high, largely because Lee seems to be holding off Grant, and that Sherman, despite the fact that he has been outmaneuvering Joe Johnston and then outright defeating John Bell Hood on the outskirts of Atlanta, he has not yet managed to capture Atlanta. So the Democrats up north who are running George B. McClellan against Lincoln in the 1864 election are able to make a lot of hay out of this failure to achieve Union objectives. They even start referring to Ulysses S. Grant as a butcher, someone who threw his men regardless of their lives at the, uh, at the Confederacy. There is some truth to that charge. Some Republicans even considered jettisoning Lincoln as their candidate. But nevertheless, Lincoln does receive the nomination from the Republican Party in early June. He refers to his ticket as the Union ticket because he's going to run with a Southern Unionist, Andrew Johnson, as president. But Lincoln didn't think that he was going to win the election, right? Slowly, however, fortunes start to change. Mobile Bay down in Alabama is captured in August, another great victory for the Navy, which often gets um, underappreciated. Um, by mid-October, Philip Sheridan, who had been assigned to try and capture the Shenandoah Valley from the Confederates, is finally having some successes. And this is after the Confederacy was able to get within just a few miles of, uh, of Washington, D.C., shelling the capital. There was one time where actually Abraham Lincoln was almost killed by a mortar from the Confederates. But then Philip Sheridan is able to chase the Confederates from away from Washington, D.C., chase them into the Shenandoah. Valley and eventually capture the Shenandoah Valley, which had been a really important part of the Confederate effort from early on in the war. That was where Stonewall Jackson came from. The Confederacy had long been in part boosted by these amazing victories won by Stonewall Jackson and, and Jubal Early later on in the, in the Shenandoah Valley. Well, this time Philip Sheridan's going to conduct a sort of war that we might refer to later as total war, or what he referred to as a policy of exhaustion against the people in the war. And Sheridan used the war to deprive the Confederacy of its entire economic infrastructure there. What does that mean? Any food that Sheridan captured from the farms of the Shenandoah River and couldn't eat, they destroyed. They burned the houses down. They burned Confederate um, farms to the ground. They destroyed the railroads. They destroyed the bridges. They waged total war, not just against the Confederates' army under Ju Jubal Early in the Shenandoah Valley, but also against the ca capacity for Southerners in the Shenandoah Valley to even make war against the North. Sheridan was trying to deprive the Confederacy of its economic an economic basis and infrastructure in the Shenandoah Valley, a kind of war which would be carried out by people like Philip Sheridan and William Tecumseh Sherman against Native Americans at the end of the Civil War. Um, and then Sherman cuts all railroad ties to Atlanta by September 1st. Without being able to supply Atlanta, they are going to starve to death. So what the Confederates do is they finally abandon Atlanta on September 1st. So with Sherman's capture of Atlanta and with Jubal Early being run out of the Confederate uh, stronghold of the Shenandoah Valley by Philip Sheridan, the Union has reversed its bad fortunes. And Lincoln wins re-election alongside a Republican wave that took over both houses of Congress. Um, in the final elect electoral tally in 1864, Lincoln wins 212 to 21 electoral votes. But Sherman is not yet done. Sherman then undertakes his so-called march to the sea. And what he's going to do here is he's going to march from Atlanta to Savannah and destroy everything every piece of Southern property or anything the Confederates could conceivably use against the Union to make war. It's a 60 mile front as they march across Georgia, making it quote unquote, howl 
as they destroy everything they find in the way. Farms, plantations, they turn railroads into Sherman neckties. What's that mean? They heat them up, bend them, and destroy them, wrap them around a tree trunk, right? So they have no railroads. They have no bridges. They have no plantations. They have no farms. They're all burned to the ground. You know, there's a famous scene in Gone with the Wind where Scarlett O'Hara is forced to eat tubers from the ground because she has her, her plantation is, going to, is being burned by Sherman. Right? Sherman destroys Georgia. Then he captures Savannah on December 20th of 1864. And then he moves north. South Carolina, which had basically had no role in this war so far. Sure, you know, the Union has been trying to capture Charleston for years and has not had much success. Well, what Sherman does is he absolutely ravages the countryside of South Carolina marching across it, doing the same thing that he had done in Georgia, destroying everything that he finds. Then finally, he moves into North Carolina. And at this point, Jefferson Davis realizes the mistake he had made in recalling Joe Johnston and sends him into North Carolina to try and prevent Sherman's men. But they don't prevent them. They just slow them down. And, you know, what this demonstrated to the South was that Sherman, the Union Army, could basically destroy the southern countryside, the old plantation belt, with little to no opposition, right? With little to no opposition. So this is the kind of war of no quarter which Sherman is raging, um, waging, I meant to say, not just against the southern armies, because, you know, Joe Johnston is somewhat ineffective. He can slow down his retreat, but he can't stop it. Hood was even worse. You know, what, what Sherman is capable of doing is to destroy the plantation belt, the basic, you know, all the, the African Americans who, you know, were still on plantations. When Sherman gets there, they just join the long march to the sea. African Americans accompanied Sherman on his march to the sea as he captured Savannah in December of 1864, moved north and captured Columbia, South Carolina in February of 1865, and then the next month moves into North Carolina. Now, the idea is that he's going to sneak up on Robert E. Lee from the other side, and Grant and Sherman will be able to capture Robert E. Lee in this giant pincher movement. That doesn't happen because, uh, at last, you know, Sherman does meet some resistance in North Carolina, which slows him down as he's advancing to Virginia, but also Grant is able to ultimately overcome the siege of Petersburg and force um, Robert E. Lee to surrender in April. But in any case, you know, maybe the most important thing to learn from this last phase of the war, especially the campaigns used by both Sheridan in the Shenandoah Valley and William Tecumseh Sherman on his march to the sea, is that you know these this war is no longer a war which is just being waged by one army against the other. It is now a war which is being waged not only against the other other side's army, but against the other side's capacity to make war, against the other side's civilian population in order to destroy their morale and to bring the war to a close. And if that's the uh, if that's the goal, if that's the ultimate objective, it is successful. By April of 1865, the war is over, and Sherman, and to maybe a perhaps lesser extent Sheridan's, utter destruction of the Shenandoah Valley and the old plantation belt of South Carolina and Georgia are at last going to bring the South to the table to sue for peace. <laughs>